Quiet on set. Picture is up. All right, roll sound. Rolling. Roll cameras. Cams rolling. And three, two. Hey, everybody. What's going on? And welcome to Hank's Think Tank. It's the continuing saga of the Montgomery County Water Wars. And you know, guys, in order to get to the truth, you always have to hear both sides of an issue. Can't get it from one side, no matter how many people you interview. And so what we try to do is get somebody here from the SJRA, and I got lucky. I got Jace Houston. He's the man. He's the general manager. He's here. He's got his side of the story. And I'll tell you, it's perplexing. So uh, it's an interesting side. You guys need to listen to it because he's got some valuable information. And I'm just glad to have you here with me today, Jace. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. So let's start out by just discussing a little bit. And, and I didn't even know this until our conversation earlier, but what is the role of the San Jacinto River Authority? In fact, I kind of start by sharing the role of river authorities in Texas because awesome. we're Definitely. one of a um, couple of dozen river authorities in the state. Okay. River authorities are really designed to, by the legislature of Texas, to implement large scale regional projects related to water. So in the early 1900s, right after the turn of the century, Texas had faced a series of really bad droughts and floods. And the legislature realized that many times small individual communities can't afford to take on a large scale regional project, the kind that are necessary to solve those big problems, like putting in a flood reservoir or building a water supply reservoir that would serve multiple communities across possibly more than one county. That's when river authorities were created. So river authorities were created to do a very specific task. Look 50 to 100 years into the future. Determine how much water supply is going to be needed for a region. How, how much uh, regional infrastructure are we going to need to serve the needs of this region? And then plan for that. Make it available. The river authority may not be the one to implement it, but at least they're doing the planning and they stand ready to implement a regional partnership project if the communities in that area would like to have it done. Most river authorities in Texas, all but a couple, don't have any taxing authority. Every project they do has to be based on a customer contract. Some local government entity, city, a MUD, a county, someone has to need a project done, talk to the river authority that's local to them, determine that, yeah, that I'd like you, Mr. River Authority, to come in and implement this project for me. And then you have to sign a contract. That's our source of revenue. So for SJRA, here's the projects we do. Our first sort of um, uh, project or business line or operation that we do is just the development and sale of raw water, meaning tree, untreated water out of lakes and rivers. Okay. So we hold some water rights in Lake Houston. We hold some water rights in Lake Conroe and in the Trinity River. We have numerous water rights kind of scattered around that we've developed and paid for over time. And we sell that untreated water to customers. Our biggest customer is Exxon Mobil's Baytown Refinery. They use as much water every day as all of Montgomery County uses in a day. Wow. And so it's a large customer. They and take that's raw water. That's raw, not untreated, untreated water. Okay. Just as we say, we don't guarantee any quality. It's just going to be wet when it gets to okay. them. And it's so, a, uh, just out of curiosity, do they treat it or do they just use it as raw water for cooling and, and things like that? Primarily untreated. Some okay. of it they have to demineralize okay. to avoid getting scale within some of their uh, Yeah, that plant. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Chevron Phillips Chemical Company, that's another large customer that buys untreated water. And so that was really SGRA's beginning, was just okay. selling untreated water out of the river, out of the lake, out of Lake Houston to customers who needed it. Uh, our next sort of operation sort of related to that. It was the construction of Lake Conroe. So looking into the future after the drought of the 1950s, Houston and other major water providers across Texas knew we need more water supply and storage in case we have another drought like we faced in the 50s. And so City of Houston built Lake Houston. They also paid for 70% of the construction of Lake Livingston, and they paid for two-thirds, 66%, of the construction of Lake Conroe. Okay. We were the one third partner in Lake Conroe. So we brought one third of the money to the table. Houston brought the other two thirds to the table. We built the project. Uh, the property is technically held in the name of SGRA, but it's on behalf of that partnership. 
So that was our second um, operation, was the construction of Lake Conroe. The next operation is a perfect example of this regional partnership uh, approach that River Authorities take. You had a developer in the Woodlands that was, this was in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. They're going to okay. start this master plan community called the Woodlands. And they knew they would develop it over decades as individual mud districts. The muds would be the water, wastewater, and drainage provider. But they didn't want to finish their development at the end of 30 or 40 years and have 10 individual wastewater systems, 10 individual water systems. They wanted to end up with a regional unified system like a city would have. So they asked SJRA, would you be willing, River Authority, to step in and sign a contract and provide that service for us? Be Build our wastewater plants, operate our plants, put in the water towers, put in the trunk system, put in the water wells for us. And that was for the individual systems, correct? For the muds. Okay. And so each time a mud would be created, they would be added to the project through a contract. So SJA would simply enter into contracts with each mud as it was created so that now, while they're near their completion, um, they don't have 10 individual systems. They have three wastewater plants that serve the entire region. Okay. And 38 water wells that serve their entire community. So it operates like a single unified system. Now, SJRA did that. We, we do that service at cost. There's no markup. There's no profit. Uh, we don't, you know, take 10% off the top and put it into some other bank account. All of our operations that we do for customer groups have to be accounted for individually and separately. So the Woodlands Division of SJRA has its own budget. Whatever the costs are to provide the service to them, that's what they pay. We don't mark it up. Those customers, in fact, vote on the budget. They vote on the rates. Okay. And they have a, a lot of say in setting their service level expectation. You know, what drives costs for utilities is, is what service level do you want? Do you want, are you okay with four or five boil water notices a year? If you are, we can save some money on maintenance. Do you want to be able to have water when there's a winter storm? Like the one we had a year ago, yeah. a year and a half ago. Nice well, storm. Yeah. yeah. If you do, if you want the water supply system to operate through a storm like that, you have to make some investments. Well, those MUDs decided years ago, decades ago, they wanted to make the investments necessary to have a system that doesn't go down very often. And so they have. They really set the budget and the rates by what service level they want. But there's no markup by SGRA. Mm -hmm. We, as an agency, would be no worse off or no better off if that division had never been created. If the Woodlands had decided to go another way and build their own water plants and wastewater plants, it, it wouldn't make any difference to SGRA as an organization. We're just here to offer these regional partnership services if they need them. Same model is being done in North Texas. The Trinity River Authority operates regional wastewater plants for mm -hmm. multiple cities in the Dallas area. North Texas Municipal Water District. They build reservoirs, pump stations, water plants, wastewater plants. They also do trash for 13 cities that are members of that partnership. That's really the role that river authorities in Texas were created so in this, in the one in the woodlands, was that catch and released where you built it, gave it to the woodlands, and they now manage it and take care of it? No, they still contract with us to operate that system for okay. them. That That's an ongoing relationship. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. Now, they that. could, theoretically, if they ever wanted to uh, decide, hey, we'd rather take these uh, services on ourselves. Mm -hmm. We could sit down at the table and figure out a way to un unwind the contract. But right now, it's still, remember, it's still 10 individual MUDs. Okay. And so someone has to run that system. For them. Okay. So that's the role of River Authorities. That is the role of River Authorities, and um, that's the service they they provide, and that's their funding model. Okay. Okay. So have you all had any contracts other than the GRP with, like, the city of Splendora, for instance? Have there been any contracts for development or, or projects like that? Here? No. No. No, we haven't. The, okay. um, we've got the Woodlands... Uh, the raw water sales. We've done some flood management projects for customers uh, okay. since Hurricane Harvey, and we're doing the GRP. But no, the okay. GRP regional partnership project would be the only one we have going that includes Splendor. Okay. Yeah, so I kind of want to move in a direction toward the GRP. So 
the main reason why I decided to take all this on to start out with anyway was because it got brought to my attention that, hey, there's an SJR fee on your water bill, Hank. Mm -hmm. And it's significant. It's like 40% of the bill. Mm -hmm. And so the more I started to look into that, the more I realized, hey, we're paying for something, but I, I don't see what we're getting. So as a Splendor resident, what are we getting for that 40% that we pay? And and I keep in mind, my bill's not much. I mean, it, I thought it was like 50 bucks or something. My wife pays all the bills. <laughs> But it's about a hundred dollars a month, so it's not bad. But out of that hundred, and I, you know, what I did was I took one of my bills and mm -hmm. redacted it. But uh, yeah, about forty three percent goes to SJRA. So yes. what's that for? What do we get for that? That's a long story, but we need to tell it. And I'm okay. so glad you asked because Great. it really is the the crux of the issue. That fee, that label, is on a lot of water bills. Across yeah, and it's Montgomery got it's County. got everybody up in arms, and you know. And I just like to get to the bottom of it and sure. figure out what we can do. And if it's a problem, a, a method by which we can fix it as Absolutely. a consortium of communities. Right. Because we're going to have to do it that way. It can't be done individually. It's going to have to be all of us. So you that know? fee is on everyone's bills because a solution was implemented. Okay. A regional partnership solution was put together and offered and 80 utilities in Montgomery County decided, yep, we're going to be part of this regional solution. And so we're, we're implementing that. We built a water plant and a lot of water lines, and we're delivering water. And those 80 utility customers are all sharing the cost. Now, to really explain the solution and why we're doing it, I kind of feel like a great place to start is the problem. Okay. Is that great. okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so let's do it. If, because if there's no problem to solve then you didn't need this half a billion dollar solution to solve it. <laughs> right. Now, I mean, I, I mean, I that's gotcha. one point that our critics have made that I entirely agree with. If there's no problem, then no one should have implemented an expensive solution. So let's talk about that for a minute. So the crux of the issue in Montgomery County is do we, or do we not have a problem with our groundwater supplies uh, throughout the country, frankly, and especially certainly in Texas and Houston, Water supplies are always used based on the cheapest one first, right? So if you're if you're going to create a mud or a new development or a city, mm -hmm. and you got to provide water to that group of customers, you're going to pick the cheapest source of supply first and use that. And, and then if you've exhausted it or if you need more than what's available, then you'll go to the next one that's more expensive and so on. Groundwater in the Houston region is the cheapest supply, okay. for sure. It comes out of the ground clean, hardly has to be treated at all. Mm -hmm. It's been filtered through sand for a thousand years or more you just put a little chlorine in it and you're done and it's great the entire houston region has been using that source of supply as its first base source for decades okay but what they found in the whole houston region is that if you pump this aquifers the, the aquifers that we all use if you pump them faster than they can recharge and replenish what you begin to see is the water level in your well starts to drop. Mm -hmm. Now, the way our aquifers are, you drill your well down, depending on where you're located, to say 1,000 to 2,000 feet below the land surface. And you go find the sands that have the water, and you perforate those sands, and you, the water comes into your well, and it rises up in your well bore. Used to rise all the way to the surface in some places. So you could drill a hole 1,500 feet deep, but the water would come out the top. Okay. Well, over the decades, and, and when I'm telling this story, I'm, I'm talking the entire Houston region for now, and I'll zoom into Montgomery County in a minute. Over the decades, water utilities began to notice, hey, as our population's grown, and as we put more wells in the ground, and as we pump this aquifer harder and harder, the water level's getting lower in our well bore. So we're having to lower our pumps we're, and then if you lower your pumps and you have to lift the water 300 feet now instead of 50 feet, now I've got to have a bigger motor sitting on top of it. Well, if mm -hmm. I have a bigger motor with more horsepower, I may have to tear down all my electrical equipment and put in new electrical equipment because I need more electricity and more horsepower. That is the challenge that our water utilities have been facing for decades. Houston region, Galveston, Brazoria, Fort Bend, and Montgomery. So that's one of the two problems is water supply. You can't, you're spending, you know, half a million dollars a year. I, I went back and asked Conroe's public works director who, who uh, no longer works there, but was there at the time, 
how much did y'all have in the budget every year for water well rehabs? And it was, he said, at least half a million dollars every year. And that's consistent. In the woodlands, we probably have a mm-hmm. million, half a million to a million dollars a year that was in our budget every year just to do well rehabs, lowering the pumps and increasing horsepower. So it's a serious problem. It's an incremental problem, right? That's why the real debate should have been over when do we implement the solution. There's really no debate that there's a problem. There's a definitely a problem. And I'll finish defining the problem here in a minute. The, the real debate was over when do we pull the trigger on solving it? Well, the, the group in Montgomery County who got to make that decision was the Lone Star Groundwater District, and they picked 2015. So we'll, we'll get to that story later. Okay. But anyway, problem number one, water supply. Water levels dropping, cost you money every year, and there is a bottom. But, but let me ask you this. Were the water levels in the aquifers dropping, or were the water levels just in the in the wells themselves dropping? Yeah, that's a distinction the other side likes to make. The aquifers are confined, so the water is coming from rainfall up in Walker County or wherever the outcrop happens to be for whichever okay. layer you're pulling from. Right. And so, actually, yes... Even the water table up there comes down slowly, but okay. not very quickly. Down here, you're pulling it from a confined aquifer. So, no, you're not dewatering the sands yet. Mm-hmm. You're just having a drop in your well bore. Okay. okay. Now, that drop is serious. And, and the rest of the story that they don't typically tell you is that there is a bottom to that. If you keep pulling that water level down, not only are you spending half a million to a million bucks a year rehabbing your well, Mm -hmm. there's a point in that well bore at which you can't lower your pump any farther. And now that well has to be abandoned. Or if you happen to have a well bore that goes the full diameter all the way down to the bottom of your well, once you pull the water level down into the sands that you have perforated, Mm -hmm. you'll create cavitation. And your water well won't work as well. So you have right. to reduce your usage of that well. You may only, there's some providers in Montgomery County today who back in 2010, 2011, 2012, before we brought surface water on, they would have days in the summer where they could only run their wells for a couple hours a day. And if they, they have to turn it off because the water level had dropped where it was going to cavitate their pump. So there's more information about this, but my point is, for people to say that this was not a water supply problem is absolutely incorrect. This is a severe water supply problem. The public utilities all knew it and know it to this day. It's not new. It's not unique to Montgomery County. It's the same challenge they've had in Harris County, Galveston County, Brazoria County, Fort Bend County for decades. Mm-hmm. And all of those counties have had to basically back off of how much they pump so that they stop that decline. You're not going to stop using groundwater. We want to use as much groundwater as possible. It's the cheapest source. Even SGRA wants, we want to pump as much groundwater as we can in the woodlands, but we recognize there's a point where you tip over and you start to cause these declines and there's a bottom. There's, there's only so far down that you can sustain that drop. Could we have made it three or four or five more years past 2015? Yes. It wasn't like there was this sudden point where the switch is going to flip and mm-hmm. it went from your well works to now your well doesn't work. It's not like that. It's, it's a gradual incremental problem. That's why I say that's really the legitimate debate is the, um, the fact of when you pull the trigger, not whether there's a problem. And just to, just to demonstrate, um, one other thing I want to point out, I'm going to try today as much as possible to everything I say to you will be less Jace Houston opinion and more data. Okay. Because I, the, the worst thing to me is if I come to a meeting with someone like this and then I walk away and somebody can point out, you know what, Jace Houston said X and here's why X is verifiably false. That would be disastrous to me. So I try to back all this up with data. So I'll provide you this whole stack. But this first slide. And I'll insert these in the video, guys, so you'll be able to see them. This first slide is just a sample to establish this that I, my claim that there's a water mm-hmm. supply problem. It's the amount of water level decline that has occurred in the Jasper Aquifer in the middle of Montgomery County. So this happens to be a group of about six Conroe wells that they've been tracking water levels in those wells for many decades. Okay. And there's been 400 feet of water level decline in those wells 
in the past 40, 50 and, and years. So, and this graph shows that water level decline in the wells. In the wells, okay. that's correct. That means those pumps have had to be lowered and the motors have had to be mm -hmm. upsized. And it means you're headed closer and closer to the top of the sand. Yes, it's a confined aquifer, mm -hmm. but the closer that water level gets to the top of the sand layers where you're getting your water from, right. the closer you're getting to a really bad situation. So that's the data to support problem number one, which is a water supply problem. Now let's switch gears. Talk about problem number two for a minute. Okay. Problem number two is subsidence. So in these aquifers, and this is not everywhere in the country, it's not everywhere in Texas, there are just certain areas where the geology of the aquifers is such that when you lower the water level and you lower the pressure within that part of the aquifer, mm -hmm. the clay layers begin to compact. Okay. And they begin to shrink. And you see that compaction as a subsiding of the surface of the land right or well lowering yeah for, you're lowering yeah. the land surface that is really what first caught the attention of scientists in the 1950s and 60s they began to see land surface subsidence and they were mm -hmm. trying to figure out what to attribute it to and they began to figure out this is being caused by fluid withdrawal in some areas it was oil and gas but across the Houston region, they were noticing we're sinking because water levels are dropping, the pressure's decreasing, and therefore the land surface is subsiding. And so do you know if they pulled that information from the Army Corps of Engineers benchmarks from years ago? Because I, I, I know that when, when Houston was first being created, the Army Corps of Engineers came through and set benchmarks throughout. There's a couple of them in the Heights area, actually. Mm -hmm. And those benchmarks are really, really old. Yes. And so they can get elevations from those. And I wonder if that's where this data came from. I can't say with 100% accuracy that it was put in by the Corps of Engineers. But okay. yes, it is those benchmarks. Okay. And those benchmarks have been re-leveled starting in 06. And then they've been re-leveled multiple times throughout the years using mm -hmm. the old-fashioned spirit levels. Right. And now with technology lately, now they re-level those benchmarks regularly using GPS satellites. Okay. And so here's another slide. This is the data All that right. shows how much subsidence has occurred in the greater Houston region all around Harris County uh, over the last hundred years due to fluid withdrawals. Okay. There's some natural compaction that occurs, just sediments sit over time, but it's, it's orders of magnitude less than mm -hmm. what's caused by fluid withdrawals. And so this shows that even all the way into Montgomery County, as far north as Conroe, there's a one foot contour. So Conroe's had a foot of subsidence. And in fact, the most recent re-leveling data is estimating that Conroe's subsidence is closer to a foot and a half. Mm -hmm. And so you take Montgomery County and historically looking backwards, we've had anywhere from a foot and a half in the middle of the county, all the way to three feet in the southern part of Montgomery County. But I wonder how much of that can be attributed just to just a natural occurrence, because I think subsidence is kind of a natural occurrence as well over time. To some extent. I mean, you got to really stretch it out over time. Yes. But yeah, you're going to see some subsidence and even it's going to come back up over time. So here's you know, the Earth's crust is constantly moving, hence yes. earthquakes and things like that. We had this debate occurred uh, back in the 90s and 2000s. I worked at the Harris Galveston subsidence district for 10 years. And this debate popped up. There was a, a professor from Louisiana who came over and gave a speech one day and tried to argue that the subsidence we were seeing was this naturally occurring. There's two methods, mm -hmm. actually. There's the flex of plate, the plate, you know, heard of plate tectonics. Right. Yeah. Part of it, he argued, was the flexing of the tectonic plates. The other part was just natural over time sediments tend to compact. And his argument was, y'all need to be measuring that. And we said, well, how much are you? talking about how fine a measurement so oh well it's it's a few millimeters per decade or a millimeter a decade right we're like we've had 10 feet it, of it subsidence would, it would be hard to measure that yes. anyway we've had 10 yeah. feet of subsidence in the ship channel in the last 40 years we've had 70 feet of subsidence or excuse me seven feet of subsidence in the jersey village area in the last 20 30 40 years mm -hmm. and you're worried about a millimeter a decade so that's the order of magnitude natural compaction is very small Fluid withdrawal subsidence is very large okay. to answer that question. So is it a problem? Okay. Someone could argue, all right, well, Jace, if I lived in uh, Kima right next to the water, 
then I'd be worried about the six feet of subsidence that Kima's had, and they ought to do something to stop that from happening any further. Mm -hmm. But I don't. They say, I live in Montgomery County. Well, okay, that's a valid point, but you know there are watersheds. So when it rains in Waller County, that rain from Waller County is coming down the Spring Creek watershed and the Lake Creek watershed, and it's headed to Lake Houston. Mm -hmm. That's its destination. And the areas of Montgomery County that have had the worst subsidence so far because of where the population has been, have been along the southern end of the county from the woodlands over to New Caney Porter. And if you look at that graphic that's on the screen, you'll see that there's been two to three feet of subsidence in the Porter, New Caney, southeast Montgomery County area. And Over so, what period of time? Over, historically, so okay. over the past hundred years. Okay. So you are lowering the bottom end of the watershed. That water's coming from Waller County, and they've had almost no subsidence. But you're lowering the bottom end, and that water's coming downhill faster into mm -hmm. an area that's already low-lying. So I argue, and many of us in the industry argue, we need to care about subsidence. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's occurring. There's really no debate that subsidence is occurring. We have data for that. We know where it's occurring. Has anyone quantified how much it impacts flooding? Not yet. The subsidence district's working on a study right now to try to quantify, does it make flooding three inches deeper or six inches deeper or, you know, what? But I don't know a, how you'd ever quantify that because it would, it would all depend on conditions. How much water is flowing mm -hmm. down? How much rain is north of here? How much rain is here? How much right. saturation the ground already has? I yep. mean, how would you ever quantify that? Because you're never going to have the same set of circumstances happen twice right. it's I, nature i'm assuming know? what they'll do is they'll take a certain modeled rainfall mm -hmm. and they'll apply it to the model and then they'll drop the elevation a foot and apply that same event to the model yeah, again and compare yeah um, and they'd have to do it on yeah several events probably to get actual science out of it yeah. but the key point is we wanted to start with the problem there are two problems mm -hmm. there's a water supply problem that public utilities have been facing for decades and there's a subsidence problem that residents and communities have been facing also for decades. It's not a mystery. It's not new. And it, it exists. It okay. is a true problem. So that's where I wanted to start. Now, okay. the, the next question I think to, to, to move to is, because we're headed towards this solution. You know, SJA implemented a solution, and it's a big part of our water bill. Mm -hmm. So, Jace, you need to explain to me what benefit I'm getting from it. Well, okay, let's continue forward in time. That's the subsidence that everyone was seeing. That's the water level declines, all based on data and evidence. What did Montgomery County do about it? Well, in back in late 90s and around 2000 time frame, community leaders in Montgomery County began debating, do we need a groundwater district? I didn't mm -hmm. work here at the time, but I worked in Harris County, and we kind of followed the debate. We'd watch it in the news, and if they held a town hall meeting, we would run up there to Montgomery County and attend the meeting. They began debating, do we need a groundwater district here in Montgomery County? Because they saw these water level declines. They mm -hmm. saw this subsidence. This was not a mystery. And they just, they created a groundwater district in 2001, the Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District. Groundwater districts in Texas, their primary responsibility is to manage aquifers. Study the aquifer. Figure out, do we have any problem? That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. That's the simplest right. way to say it. Their job is to determine if there's a problem. If there's a problem... How do we solve it? So they can regulate pumpage. That's the only way they have to solve the problem. You either regulate pumpage or you don't. And there's different, lots of different ways they can go about doing that. So the groundwater district was created in 01. It was an appointed board. They've made a lot of hay about the fact that it was appointed and not elected. I mean, I, I, I don't care either way. The facts and the data and evidence are still the same. Mm -hmm. They happen to use an appointed board. You know, almost half the districts in Texas are appointed and maybe 40 percent, about 60 percent are elected. I don't okay. remember the exact number, but it's not uncommon to have an appointed board. That board began studying the aquifer. We watched it from where I was working in Harris County, just kind of kept up with it. They actually came down and asked us, hey, how do you all regulate aquifers down here? Uh, how do you all go about doing that? One of the comments that was made uh, on a previous podcast, I just marveled at was there was a statement by Jim that Harris County doesn't have any groundwater regulation. We actually regulate groundwater up here, and they don't, they don't regulate at all. And that just about blew my mind because the groundwater restrictions in Harris County are tremendously more strict 
we don't have any groundwater regulation in Montgomery County right now. Mm -hmm. Now we did the, that Lone Star Groundwater District created in 2001, set up a rule in 2006 that said all the large utilities in the county are going to have to cut back 30%. Right. The subsidence district's cutbacks are 90% in Galveston County. 80% cutback in the southern and sort of central part of Harris County and 30% cutback in North and West Harris County, and that's going to 60%. So they are restricting pumpage by 90, 80, or 60%. And, and Jim made the claim that they don't regu they don't, their regulations aren't as stringent as what we have in Montgomery County. I don't mm -hmm. even know where to begin to address that, but that's, that's the facts. Okay. So anyway, back to the, the story. Lone Star's board began studying the aquifer. They were trying to find what is that amount? What's that amount we can pump without causing this problem or continuing this problem. They settled on the number of 64,000 acre feet. It, it's, it's never intended in the groundwater world, nothing's ever precise. 60, 65, 70, it's somewhere in that range. We can quibble over 64, we can quibble over how they picked 64. If I had been working here at the time, I wouldn't have picked 64. Mm -hmm. I would have picked a big round number, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, just something that looks like you didn't try to create a specific number. Um, but they picked a number and they announced, they adopted a set of rules and they announced to all the utilities in the county, uh, y'all are going to have to cut your demand back by about 30% because the number they picked was 64,000 acre feet countywide. And, and that was their solution at the time. Now, the next part of the story is where SJRA comes in. SJRA had one appointment to that board at the time, Okay, as did the Woodlands, Conroe, Montgomery County appointed three, some MUDs appointed, MUDs appointed two. I mean, it was a combination of appointments by all these utilities that are in the water business. Okay. So they got to appoint members to this board to represent them because who is this groundwater district going to regulate? Mm -hmm. The utilities. That's who will ultimately have to manage their pumpage in order to get this problem solved. So that's why the board was set up as an appointed board. Now they've made a lot of hay also about the fact that there was a waiver in the statute waiver for conflicts, conflicts of, interest. of interest. Yeah. I was going to ask the, about that. The reason that waiver was put in the statute was because you're going to have cities and, and MUDs appointing probably their employees. The cities would probably appoint a public works director mm -hmm. to go serve on this board. And there was a concern that if a public works director who's an employee of the city of Conroe, for example, was going to vote on a set of regulations that that regulated their city, that that would be considered a, a conflict of interest. And because he's voting on something that applies to his employer. Right. And so yeah, they I say, look, that. let's just put in a waiver of the conflict of interest because we want our utilities <clears throat> to be able to appoint employees or council members or mayors mm -hmm. or people who will then represent the interest of that city. That's why it was put in there. It had nothing to do with anyone's financial or pecuniary interest. That's that's all been a story that's been fabricated after the fact with no knowledge of why it was done in the beginning. Okay. I know why it was done in the beginning because I know the people that did it. Right. So let's get back to the study that was created by the Lone Star Groundwater okay. Conservation District. In that study, and I don't, I don't have the figure with me, for some reason it escapes me, but they claim that there that the aquifer consisted of x number of acre feet and that turned out to be wrong because the united states geological survey came back and said we had 83 million acre feet of groundwater which is to me an astronomical amount okay now i'm not saying that we're not depleting that 83 right, million right, right. that's still to me a possibility because i know that there's a lot of people out here but being that that study was incorrect, but that study was used as the basis for their 70-30 rule, doesn't that invalidate the 70-30 rule completely? It no. seems like it does. No, it doesn't because they never did that study. And they never did any kind of an assessment of the volume in the aquifer. And so their regulations if they didn't do an assessment of the volume of the aquifer, then because, how do they come up with 70-30? Right. It's because the volume in the aquifer, most of which is salt water, mm -hmm. is not the problem. The problem is how fast are you pulling the pressure down? That's, the, that's what's causing the subsidence in the water well problems. It's 
if you are pumping it faster than it recharges, then right. it creates these problems. But that's hydrostatic pressure in the well. That's correct. In the well. Yes. Not in the aquifer. Well, it's the pressure in the aquifer, and that pressure is measured by how far the water comes up in your well. So you're reducing the pressure in the sands of the aquifer around your well, mm -hmm. and then you can see how you're doing it because the water level in your well drops. Okay. So the problem is not how much volume is down there. The problem is that we are producing it faster than it can replenish. So Mr. Spigner noted in his... Uh, okay, so I'm going to say something that's going to sound like it came from a third grader, okay. but I'm going to say it. So if you have a problem with the hydrostatic pressure in your well... Mm -hmm. and you're basically pumping your well dry, mm -hmm. why not just move over, poke another hole, use both wells? Because the aquifer is regional. If you put wells... And so that hydrostatic pressure extends out from yes. a well for X number of feet? Yes, that's and correct. And possibly that X number of feet is beyond our border, I guess, and we would that be able to correct. poke another well somewhere. That's right. If you... That the influence of the, the area that you're reducing the pressure in around your well, okay. it, it's several feet, hundreds of feet, miles, and it depends Whatever on which layer. Be. Yes, right. it depends on which layer of the aquifer yeah. you're in. And I would think it would change with every well. And it, and it changes with your location in the aquifer. Sure. There's that a lot of sense. variables, yeah. right? So what happens is there are hundreds of water wells in Montgomery County. We've poked holes all over this thing. Mm -hmm. And so we're lowering the pressure regionally across the aquifer, and that pressure is transmitting through the sands, right? You don't, you're not poking a hole into a discrete little aquifer that you only influence. We're all mm -hmm. sharing the same bathtub. Okay. And so these pressure uh, reductions. Would you say it like that? <laughs> Sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> these pressure reductions are, are across the aquifer. And that's why you see in that contour map that we put up on the screen earlier, it's subsidence is regional. It, okay. It's not little pockets around water wells. It's, it's broad and regional across the aquifer. Because we're all sharing that, that same aquifer. Multiple layers, but same aquifer. And so, the here, let me tell you about the TERS report. That's the report they keep pointing to. It wasn't done by USGS. It was performed okay. by Texas Water Development Board. It was a le legislature required the board, oh, maybe 10 years ago, to do this report called the TERS report. And it was really hotly debated at the legislature because it was being pushed by a group of water marketing lobbyists who wanted to go in and pump water out of certain parts of Texas and move it hundreds of miles to provide right. yeah, water for other that. parts of mm -hmm. Texas. Okay. And the what they were running into is that the county they wanted to pump the water from, which had way more groundwater than they would ever use in their future, they were trying to prevent anyone from taking water out of their county by arguing, well, we don't have enough for ourselves. So these lobbyists went to the legislature and basically said, we want you water development board to produce a report for every county in texas that shows what the volume of water is in the aquifer for each county and that was okay. the ters report okay so for montgomery county it's i think 185 million acre feet is the volume in the sand that's crazy it's yeah. a lot problem is most of it's salt water and the amount that's fresh you couldn't extract it if, if unless you had all the money in the world it's like an oil it's like an oil reservoir okay if if you take the Ellenberger formation out in West Texas and somebody comes to you and says, there's a hundred million barrels of oil underground in the Ellenberger formation. So I'm, you're going to put an oil company together and you're going to go start extracting it. Your geologist wouldn't come to you and say, this is going to be great because we're going to extract a hundred million barrels out of this formation. Mm -hmm. They're going to come to you and say, well, when we poke that first well, it's going to be under pressure and it's going to come out and we're going to get X number of barrels of oil a year. Mm -hmm until the pressure goes away. Once the pressure goes away, we're going to have to put pump jacks out there. And we're going to have to lift the oil. Okay. Once we, once that doesn't become economical, we're going to have to do water flooding and we're going to have to flood one part of the formation to push the oil to our well bores. So you see, the point is you can't get every molecule of oil out of there unless you put in hundreds or thousands of oil wells with pump jacks and you need more money. So when oil is $100 a barrel, that's when these companies go in and produce more. But when oil's $30 a barrel, they can't afford to mm -hmm. extract it. It's the same with water. Water is sold to the customer at about, you know, 2 to $6 per thousand gallons. Okay. That's a, that's a very low cost for a large volume. It's cheap. Mm -hmm. And so 
if you have to put in, in the Woodlands to serve the 120,000 customers there, we have about uh, 38 water wells. And that's because they each produce about 800 to 1,000 gallons a minute. Okay. If you lower the pressure in the aquifer, continue to drop it and drop it and drop it, the yield of those water wells drops so to where they're producing two or 300 gallons per minute. Now, you ha- now you'll need five times the number of water wells to continue to meet the same customer demand. That's the problem with the TERS report. And the Water Development Board, when they produce that report, I should get a copy of it for you and send it to you. Okay. They put a disclaimer at the beginning of the report that says, this number does not reflect the reality of what you can pump from these aquifers because it doesn't take into account the cost. It doesn't take into account salinity and the fact that the salt water would require treatment. It doesn't right. take into account subsidence. It, t- it was strictly an estimate of how much is there, how many molecules are there. That's why that whole report, it's a red herring. They've been using that argument from the beginning. They're not telling the whole story. They don't tell the public what that report really means. And recharge actually is everything. That's the, that is the problem with our aquifer. It's not the volume. It's the fact that the aquifer is so tight and the water moves through it so slowly mm-hmm. that if we pump it faster than it can replenish, you see decline We're it. Yeah. and you see subsidence. Okay. Sorry for the long explanation, but no, that's, that's okay. the facts. That's okay. So, you know, we've got a lot of litigation and this has been going on for years. So mm-hmm. bottom line, how do we fix it? How do we well, just fix it? Let, let me tell I you. Mean, how there's st- there's got to be a way to fix it. Sure. And let me tell you how it started. I think that's important to the story. So it's been, oh, and we need to finish the benefit. What's the benefit to the residents? Yeah, okay. what is the benefit All to right. the residents? Because they're going to want to know. Sure. Yeah. So I, I hope I've established, at least I've given people a clue and they can research it themselves. There is a problem. There are actually two big problems. Lone Star was created to solve that problem. So Lone Star's board set about that project in 2001, and they studied and studied and studied and held stakeholder meetings until 2006, okay. and they adopted a goal. They said, we think... We should not pump more than 64,000. And if we can do that, it'll stop these water level declines. And, and that's 64,000 county countywide. Okay. Countywide. And the county at the time was using 80 to 90,000. So okay. it meant they needed to cut back about 30,000 acre feet. Mm-hmm. So there were 200 utilities in the county that were subject to that restriction. All, okay. all of us, Woodlands was one that we, SRA represents them by contract. Conroe is one, and Splendor, and Magnolia, everybody else. Sure. 200. The, those utilities began talking amongst themselves. How are we going to do this? How are we going to accomplish this? How are we going to all cut back 30%? Because every one of us was required to cut back 30%. So SGRA was at the table with everybody else, and we said, look, we have a water supply. Lake Conroe was built for future water supply. That's why it's there. So we have a water supply. We can provide that water to anyone who wants it. Uh, And in fact, if you want, we can offer up a regional solution. That's what river authorities do. Remember, that's where I started this whole conversation. We could build a single plant and build some pipeline to distribute water to customers, but create a partnership where any entity in the county can join in this effort. And we think it'll be cheaper in the long run. And here's why. If... Splendora, we're going to convert and lower its, remember, it's got to cut back 30%. Mm-hmm. So they got to figure out a way to cut that back. And you can't just go to the customers and say, hey, everybody, I need you to not flush on Fridays or we're not, you know, not water your yard <laughs> or whatever. not going to work. <laughs> not going to work. Yeah. You have to have an alternative supply. Okay. So Splendora has to decide, how are we going to achieve this? Well, Lone Star put a very creative provision in their rules that they learned from Harris County. The permittees in Harris County decades ago, went to the subsidence district and said, we don't want you to tell us how to convert. You just tell us the goal. We'll figure out how to get there because we want to form partnerships and pool our resources and get these economies of scale. So fast forward to Montgomery County, the river authority offered up the same solution. We said, we'll put together a plan that anyone in the County can join, no matter where you're located. And we'll put out, a projection of what it'll cost. We'll tell you exactly what we would have to build, where we would build it, who we would deliver water to, to achieve this 30% conversion. And anyone who wants can join and it, it will, re- you will have achieved compliance 
Okay, so that's one benefit is by joining this group, you are meeting the regulations of the Lone Star Groundwater District. You will be in compliance. Okay. So that's one benefit. The other benefit is when you do the project and you convert these six or seven or eight larger utilities over to surface water and they reduce the amount of groundwater they're pumping, the aquifer will stop dropping. And so the our customers who are not receiving surface water now benefit from stable water levels. So their public works director doesn't have to go out there every year and lower the pump and upsize the motor and spend that half a million dollars on their water wells. They're avoiding that problem because the problem's been solved, but we didn't solve it by building a water line to every utility in Montgomery, Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. You know, that would not have been cost effective. So let me ask you this. The surface water treatment plant that's that exists now, the $500 million plant, mm -hmm. does it have the capacity to pump that surface water all the way to Splendora if, if we had the infrastructure to, to get it? Today, yes. The capacity of the current phase is 30 million gallons a day. Okay. And the right now... Is that the plan for the future to, no, to the, pipeline all the way out oh. here and give us surface water? I'd have to go back and look at the original. We, we were required by Lone Star to turn in a 40-year plan. What Every utility, all 200, had to turn right. in a plan to Lone Star that told them what you would do for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. So we were required to make that plan. And so it was built out in phases. So you build phase one, mm -hmm. which was the plant at the dam, and you only would serve about seven entities. Conroe, the Woodlands, Oak Ridge North, Rayford Road, um, um, Montgomery County Mud 99, there were six or seven customers on phase one. Okay. Then. And those pipelines are already built. Yes, that's, those that's are built. That's done. Yes. Okay. Phase one's and Those customers are receiving water. Okay. And then in future phases, as the population of the county grows, remember, we can't really pump more than about 60 or 65,000, according to Lone Star, without seeing the problem. So as the county grows, you're going to need to bring on more surface water to meet that growth. Okay. So the plan laid out an, a, a concept for, okay, for 10 years later, for phase two, you're going to need to extend the line and go a little farther and then add a few more units to the plant to get more capacity. Phase three in 30 years, you would have to extend the lines a little farther, upsize the plant. So it was all built out in phases. I don't know if, Splend if Splendora specifically mm -hmm. was going to be our surface water recipient in phase three or phase four, but we could look in the plans and see. Okay. I don't yeah, remember how curious. far. Yeah. But the goal, honestly, is to build as little pipeline as possible and serve enough customers to keep the pumpage at that magic level where you don't get the declines. The goal is just to solve the problem. The goal has always been from day one, solve the problem, mm -hmm. which is water level declines and subsidence at the lowest cost, which means don't build any more infrastructure than you absolutely have to have. Okay. So the, the SJRFA fee that we pay basically goes for operations and maintenance for all that existing stuff already to prevent depletion of the aquifer where we are. That is correct. Right? That is is correct. That, that's what I'm understanding? Okay. Yes. That's, yeah. that's a great way to describe it. Yeah, I just wanted it takes to make pressure. sure I had it. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I had it down. Yeah, it takes so. pressure off the aquifer okay. in those Conroe Woodlands area, <clears throat> but that then has an effect regionally because we share the same aquifer. Okay. And is this the same method by which Houston solved their problems with, I mean, because I know Houston uses a lot of surface water. Mm -hmm. So do they get surface water from Conroe as well, Houston? No. At this point? Not right now. Just from Lake Houston? Lake Houston, yes. Lake and the Houston Trinity River. Nasty. I wouldn't want to drink none of that down there. Yeah. I just, yeah. And they use this same approach. So they, they bring the surface water from Lake Houston. They treat it and they deliver it to certain areas, but they have regional groups. Mm -hmm. Regional groups have formed, and they're not taking surface water all the way to Hockley. I mean, right. that's miles and miles. It would be cost inefficient. So they only deliver it, say, along the 1960 corridor, mm -hmm. convert those customers, but it takes pressure off the aquifer. It solves the problem at the lowest cost. Okay. And by the way. And just, so that the aquifers that Houston pumps out of are the very same aquifers that we pump out of, correct? Almost, but not quite. And it's a, this is an important distinction. The Jasper that 
we get the majority of our water in Montgomery County out of the Jasper. Okay. By the time you get down to Harris County, it's too deep. So there's a few entities at the very northern edge of Harris County who will mm-hmm. go ahead and drill down to the Jasper. But Harris County uses primarily the Chico and Evangeline, which are shallower. Okay. They're also thicker. Mm-hmm. So one of the claims that the other side makes uh, all the time is that, you know, they're pumping 200,000 acre feet a year. They're pumping way more than we do. So they're the cause yeah, of the Yeah, I just wanted problem. to make sure, right, that well, right that they were being harnessed the same way we are. Yeah, yeah, they are being restricted way more than we are, number one. And number two, they're not even really using the same aquifers we do. Okay. We use some evangeline in the southern half of Montgomery mm-hmm. County, but it's getting really shallow. So even in the woodlands, only about 40% of our usage comes from the evangel and the other 60% is Jasper. By the time you get to Conroe, it's 100% Jasper. All of Conroe's wells are in the Jasper because that's the aquifer that's the most plentiful and shallow and fresh Mm -hmm. up here in Montgomery County. Yeah, and cold. And that's important because each aquifer has slightly different geologic characteristics. They both experience subsidence, Mm -hmm. um, but... In the Evangeline, the sands are looser and the water recharges a little more efficiently than it does in the Jasper. And so the what when I put a water well in the Evangeline, its pressure impact, that influence of the pressure reduction doesn't mm-hmm. go as far. But in the Jasper, because it's 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 a it's a I'm gonna use the word tighter, that's probably not the right geologic term. You reduce the pressure in the dense. Jasper. I would say dense. Yeah, yeah, you reduce the pressure in that layer and that those impacts <clears throat> go farther. <clears throat> And, and that, that's an important distinction. Another distinction that's, that they've tried to make, those two hydrologists that came to Montgomery County in 2014 and started this whole story that we don't have a problem, one mm-hmm. of the things they said, and one of them actually put it in an affidavit, a sworn affidavit, that said the Jasper Aquifer has never and will never experience subsidence. That's the hydrologic expert that, that, that the other side's relying on. Well, in this packet of information, I'm going to leave with you. There are numerous. And is that because of depth? It's not true. So I don't know why they claim that. Hmm. The fact is the Jasper does compact. And in fact, the most recent study and the the link to the study is in here is that the Jasper is responsible for about 30% of the compaction and subsidence that we see in Montgomery County. So not, I mean, the, the statement that it has never and will never experience subsidence is completely false. The fact of the matter is it does. And there's multiple peer reviewed studies that show that. And now the latest one has quantified that, that it's about 30% of the compaction that we see in Montgomery County. And so, I mean, that's, that's, what's been mind numbing about this whole debate. The fact that someone would walk in and say, we don't have a problem because there's 185 million acre feet of water down there. Mm -hmm. That's not telling the whole story. It's not telling the story about what happens when you start to tap into that. Right. If we could tap that 185 million, if we had a karst aquifer, meaning it's just caverns of limestone, right. no subsidence, it's just giant pockets of water, 185 million acre feet, we would never have built a plant. We would all be using groundwater and everybody would be happy today. But we don't have that aquifer. We have an aquifer that when you pump it faster than it can recharge, you get a decline in the well, which causes cost, and you get subsidence, which causes cost. So the Lone Star Groundwater District Board in its early years had a decision to make. They looked at those problems, they did studies, they actually did, and I have it in here for you. They ran a model. What would happen to our water levels if we just use groundwater? Don't take any surface water, just keep pumping groundwater to meet all of our future population growth in Montgomery County. The model showed that the water levels in the Evangeline would decline 800 to 1,000 feet, and the water levels in the Jasper would decline 900 to 1,100 feet. And you would get a lot of subsidence that resulted from that. Mm -hmm. And if the water levels do decline that far, it has declined down into the sand layers, and your wells just, they won't produce. You can run them maybe a couple hours a day, and you got to turn them off. So they knew all this. They knew the problem. They understood it. Okay. And there's been a claim that somehow SGRA manipulated that board. The the theory is that SGRA set about prior to 2000 with this plan that we would get a groundwater district created in Montgomery County so that they could then regulate the aquifer and restrict pumpage to force people to buy our surface water. That's Mm -hmm. the theory. Um, 
there's a lot of reasons that that's not true. Number one, SJRA did have an appointee on that nine member board, one appointee of nine, our local senator, Senator Creighton, was a member of that first board mm -hmm. after Lone Star was created. I can guarantee you 100 percent there was n he was not under our control. <laughs> and, and I would say the same about all the members on that board. SJRA didn't control it. But what's ironic in all of this is the general manager of SJRA at the time who was appointed to serve as that one vote on the board. He didn't even want to do a regional GRP. He didn't want to propose that solution. He his position was at the time, look, we built a lake. It's here for y'all's use. If y'all need it so that you can reduce your groundwater pumpage, come on up here and get it. We're happy mm -hmm. to sell it to you. But when he passed away, there were some stakeholder meetings in 2007 and eight. When I first came to work at SJRA, I was in the room during these meetings and community leaders. So you had county officials and Lone Star people and public works directors and state reps or just a bunch of people in the room. And I can't remember exactly who. And proposals were being thrown around. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, what if uh, one of the proposals was, you know what? In fact, SJRA proposed Montgomery County. Why don't y'all create a, a, a new agency to implement this plan? We've got we've got water. They're welcome to come take. We'll, we'll get surface water to them. But rather than us create a regional solution, why don't y'all create a new governmental entity? Call it the Montgomery County Regional Water Authority. And it can have its own board and its own entity, and it can implement the GRP. Right. But we were told in that meeting, no, this we're a very conservative county, and the last thing we want is another unit of government. We want to be efficient. You already exist. You can do it and save all those administrative costs of having to create another governmental entity. And the River Authority said, okay, fine, we'll do it. We will offer up. We'll create the plan. We'll put it together, we'll draft up a contract, and we'll offer this plan to any entity in Montgomery County that wants to join. Not everybody joined. There are over 30 groundwater reduction plans in Montgomery County. Shenandoah, for example, they did a plan by partnering with City of Panorama Village, Panorama mm -hmm. drilled a Catahoula well, Shenandoah paid their share of it, and as a group of two, they achieved the conversion requirements of Lone Star. And you know, there's, like I said, there's over 30 other GRPs where people came up with creative ways to solve this problem and comply with Lone Star's rules without having to join SJRA. We were not the only game in town. We didn't hold the gun to anybody's head. I mean, that all makes great press and it mm -hmm. certainly sounds good if you're trying to sway the public to your uh, fanciful imagine imagined uh, conspiracy theory, but it's not true. It's not what happened. The River Authority offered this regional solution because that's what River Authorities do. That's why we were created by the legislature, was to find the cheapest way to solve problems and facilitate that happening. And okay. that's what we did. All right, so let me ask you this. How much is left on the bonds? How much is left to pay on the bonds? $425 million. Wow, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. I thought it was less than that. Yeah. Okay. And let's talk about so, that for a second. Or go ahead. Sure. I mean, we can. We okay. can. I was going to we'll try to get closer to what do you think it would take to end the litigation uh -huh. and and move forward from here while saving the good citizens of East Montgomery County and actually Montgomery County as much money as possible. Sure. And still achieving the goals we need to achieve. Well, to you do know, that. How do, I mean, I guess my real question is, number one. How do we do away with the conflicting reports, get down to good science mm -hmm. first? Because we need good science. Can't go anywhere without it. Yep. And then secondly, how do we just end all this litigation and get back to working yep. together? Because we have to work together. It, even after all this litigation is over with, we're going to have to work together. Yes. That's all there is to it. Absolutely. So, so let's start with the science. You know what's interesting is all, all this data that I've been referring to, to when I'm in this conversation is, is, is not ours. We didn't go and do the surveys. Mm -hmm. We didn't do the benchmark relevelings. We didn't even do the um, predictive surveys. So when in this latest round of debates about how much can we pump, oh, I need, the science is so important and the science really <clears throat> isn't even in question. It's people's interpretation of it. That's yeah, there's question. a problem. And so, and how, and, they and I can, I can see it going both ways. Yeah. Like even on subsidence, I can see it going both ways. 
So, so, so how take, do we get down to what's actually happening, I guess, yeah. is the question. Well, let's take subsidence just as one example of how people will portray things in two different ways. Okay. The, there's, an aqu- there's an aquifer goal that's recently been voted on. So the way the state of Texas works is groundwater districts have to meet together in regions. They have to decide on what they want their aquifer to look like over the next 30 to 50 years and agree on an aquifer goal. An aquifer goal was voted on unanimously by the groundwater districts of our okay. region. Lone Star is one of those votes. And that goal was to, we only want a certain amount of water level decline. We don't want the decline to be more than 30%, I think, the, no, I don't know. I can't remember the quantity, but there's a certain amount of decline they've all agreed is okay. And they ran a bunch of models, and they determined that for Montgomery County to meet that goal, it would mean pumping no more than about 97,000 acre-feet a year. If if you limit your pumpage to 97,000 acre-feet a year, you'll hit the goal. Okay. Okay. Well, this graphic, you can put that one on the screen. All right. This is the amount of subsidence that will occur... If Montgomery County pumps 97,000 acre feet a year from now on, okay, if we pump 97,000 acre feet a year, you'll get another foot or two of subsidence in the woodlands, and you'll get over three feet of subsidence in the southeast part of Montgomery County. Over what period of time? Over the 70 year planning period of this model. So over the next you know, 50 to 70, and we don't know when that'll occur, by the way, either. We don't know. It it might all occur in the first 30 or 40 years. None of us may be even here. Well, that's true. And that's one of the problems with this issue is you go to a member of the public and tell them, oh, this problem's going to occur over 50 years ago. Well, it ain't my problem then. I won't be around. But that's too bad. I I care about a longer time frame. But New Caney Porter is Mm -hmm. expected to have two to three feet of additional subsidence, even if we limit pumpage to 97,000 acre feet. Well, Mr. Spigner characterizes this as, well, that's a half a foot of subsidence across the county on average. Well, that, that actually may be a true statement. I don't know, mm-hmm. but let's say it is. Let's say that, that <coughs> this, equal, this equals half a foot of subsidence on average. Okay. To me, the average is irrelevant if I live in New Caney. Right. If yeah. I, if you're in the low spot, yeah. Forget so the average. <laughs> I really think people ought to, this is the data. This is the hard data that no one can dispute. Okay. If I'm in a debate and they want to characterize it as half a foot across the county, I mean, I, I can't dispute that. I just don't think it's a fair representation of the facts. I think what people ought to do is they ought to look at the graphic and they ought to look at the real picture, the real data, and say, decide if this is acceptable. I think people in New Caney and Porter would not find this acceptable. I know the people in the Woodlands don't find it acceptable because chairman of the Woodlands, Gordy Bunch, went up and spoke at the Lone Star board meeting and said, we don't want this to happen. Mm -hmm. So I know the Woodlands is on record opposing this. And yet the Lone Star board is going around and telling people we don't have a problem because it's only half a foot of subsidence countywide. So, so how do I work together? How do I negotiate a settlement with people who will look at the same data as me and characterize it completely different. That's been our underlying problem. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the litigation. But we that's can't what, litigate forever either. I know. You I, know. Know? I mean, it's costing the taxpayers money. It's it's taking your time. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's probably keeping you from attacking other projects such as flood control and things Absolutely. like that. So, so let, let, you know, the litigation. You know, it's not helping the Lone Star Board either. We, we've, so. been, it, we've been characterized as um, SGRA is trying to protect this big conspiracy theme, and so they've launched all this litigation against people. Here's how it works in reality. When you borrow money from the state of Texas, four or five hundred million dollars from the state of Texas, you sign bond covenants. Right. These are promises that you have to perform if you're going to borrow their money. One of those bond covenants is that we have to enforce the contracts. That's our duty. So in 2016, when the city the first breach of the contract was in 2016 when Conroe City Council voted, we're not going to pay the full rate. Mm-hmm. We're going to keep paying last year's rate, but River Authority, we want you to keep delivering the same amount of surface water to us, but we're just going to keep paying last year's rate. That's a breach of the contract, and we're required by our bond covenants to enforce the contract, so we had to file suit. Now, we had been talking to them for months. They had come to me months before and warned me, hey, Jace, y'all need to not implement this rate increase because our our voters are calling us, and they're complaining about their water bills. Mm-hmm. And my answer was, you have a voting representative on our customer committee. 
your voting representative has already approved this rate and this budget. And now you're telling me months later that you're upset about the rate. I can't change it at this point. Plus the rate is set to break even. We don't make a profit. Okay. The rate is structured so that every year is basically a zero sum game. You, you charge the customers the amount that it costs to run the system. There's no profit built into this. I said, I can't lower the rate because I don't have enough time. And if I do, we won't be able to pay our debt. And they basically said, well, we're going to big, we're going to have a big vote and we're not going to pay it. And I was like, do what you have to do. And they did, you know, mm -hmm. they voted to not pay it. We had to file suit and off the litigation goes. Okay. Well, this breach of contract was never over the science. It was never about the budget. It was never about the rates they breached because they had voters upset about their water bills. They had been told by a hydrologist that we don't have a, you don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, you got plenty of water, 185 million acre <clears throat> feet. Don't worry about subsidence. There's no compaction in the Jasper, all of which I think I've established is inaccurate. And so they breached because of politics. And I've been told that numerous of times since 2016, uh, some, sometimes by the council members themselves have mm -hmm. told me, look, Jace, your budget's fine. We don't have any problem with your rates. We know we need the water. We just got angry voters and you know, we needed to do that. That's what I'm facing. So I've been trying for six years now in settlement talks, ongoing mm -hmm. settlement talks with multiple administrations, by the way, to come up with a settlement to put this behind us. But the problem is they want the water. They, they don't want the contract to go away, but they want a graceful exit. They want a way to get out of this litigation that makes it look like they didn't lose anything. And I don't know what to do because my job under the bond covenants, mm -hmm. I have to collect the payments. There are 80 utilities in this contract. Four of them are breaching. The other 76 expect me and, and to this enforce is the contract. really a problem that I talk about a lot. <clears throat> and it all boils down to voter education. So if they've got angry voters, then what they need to do or and I don't know if it should have fallen upon you guys because you have the, the data and the knowledge or if it should have been the city of Conroe, but somebody should have started holding town halls and said, Hey, this is why we're paying what we're paying. And we have to continue to do this because of the bonds, because of this, because of subsidence and you educate your voters. Yes. And yes. yeah, a bunch of them are going to walk away still unhappy, but that's, mm -hmm. that reminds me, you of know, a, that's the end of it. That, instead of, instead of starting, all this litigation and, and moving forward, I'd have gone right back to the voters and said, Hey, this is where we're at. What do you think we should do? Yeah. You that, know, that's so true. And it <clears throat> reminds me of a story in the midst of all the <clears throat> settlement talks over the last five years. One, at one point, uh, one of the council members asked me, well, what'd they do in Harris County? Their rates went up when they implemented their GRPs. What did they do? And I said, you know what they did? They, all the cities together, because they all had water rate increases, mm -hmm. they locked arms and they educated the public. That's what you got to do. They gain. told the public yeah. why. This is why. We're not doing this program for no reason. We're certainly not doing this program because the River Authority is trying to make a buck or some kind of profit by foisting some and kind see, of conspiracy. At that point, they could have even come to you guys and y'all could have done it together. We could have. I have all the data. That's, I would have helped them. In yeah. fact, when this whole program started in 2010, we held meetings with their call takers. We called it call taker meetings. Mm -hmm. We said, who's going to be answering the phones for you? We want to bring them into our office. We'll have an all day meeting and we're going to educate them on all this story because you're going to get phone calls. Right. When your rates begin to go up because we're implementing a solution that's much needed to solve a real problem. You're going to get phone calls and we want to provide you the answers. So we would have been right there with them to educate the public. That's a hard job. It takes time. You've got to interact with the public. It's tough. You got to face some angry people. But the alternative is you can just breach for purely political reasons and we can all waste millions. But of I dollars. do trust our voters. And I think once voters mm -hmm. know what's going on, they make the right choice, even if it hurts. I hope you so. Know? Because honestly, that's why I'm here today. I'm here. I wanted, I, I'm so thankful to have the opportunity to share with you and with your audience the real, the real story, the, the, the other side. And, and okay, fine. I'll, I'll, claim it's my perspective. I happen to think it conforms with reality, but, and at least I'm bringing data mm -hmm. to, to try to back up the statements uh, that I make, but I do think we have a problem. I think the river authority stood up and offered a solution that would save everyone money in the long run. 
and now we're being characterized as having done it for nefarious or selfish reasons. The proof that that's another proof that that's not true. Back in 07 and 08, when this all was beginning to be planned, the community leaders in that stakeholder meeting were asked, in addition to asking them, why don't you create your own Montgomery County Authority? Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that was proposed was, what if you just create regions? I mean, just make like the Woodlands and Conroe go first. Right. Uh, because that's where most of the subsidence had been historically, and they've got the biggest customer bases. And the answer we got back was, no, that's going to create winners and losers in the county, right? If you, if the Woodlands had gone it alone, we did a study, a little mm -hmm. kind of desktop study at the time. What if the Woodlands in that I-45 area were the only people to convert? Because they, they were accused us recently of... SJA just did this because they knew they wanted to put the woodlands on surface water and they mm -hmm. wanted everyone else to pay for it. That was the latest claim. That study showed that the woodlands would have actually been better off going it alone. Mm -hmm. And here's why. They're pretty much built out. Their population is not right. going to grow. Right. They could have done yeah, phase one. They mm -hmm. could have done phase one. Their rates would have been more initially, like mm -hmm. seven to eight bucks a thousand instead of three. So, you know, two to three times more initially, mm -hmm. but once they pay off that debt, they're done and their rates would have gone down, but the rest of the county would not have had that customer base to share the solution with. Right. We showed that group of stakeholders that in the long run, the most cost effective solution, if you take a countywide view, is that we all stay in this together. If you want to take a selfish view, the Woodlands could have done this on their own and actually been better off in the long run. Right. That's why the whole conspiracy theory blows my mind. The whole theory that SRA did this just to benefit their customer in the Woodlands, it's actually the opposite of the truth. Okay. Well, Jace, I appreciate you coming in today. And uh, I know you're a busy guy, so taking the time to do this is important. We do have the public forum coming up um, Tuesday. September the 20th, it's going to be at the Community Room at Randall Reed Stadium in New Caney at 6.30 p.m. Everybody who's a voter is invited to attend, and I suggest that you do it because this is a complicated topic, and we need to get to the bottom of it. And maybe as citizens, we can help drive these guys back to the table where they can sit down, negotiate, turn off the litigation, save us all a lot of money and time, and come up with some solutions that make this a better place to live where we don't run out of water. So I'm Hank Vatt. This is Hank's Think Tank, and we're out.